And uh, as, as part of the networking, I wanted to uh, do a few introductions. First of all, I will uh, I will try to introduce myself here. Uh, so I am Rob Pasick, and I am the founder of uh, Leaders Connect. I'm also an executive coach. I work with uh, organizations, small and large, and I also do a lot of um, career coaching. Work with many of you and hear about job transitions. And I'm a, a professor, lecturer at the uh, University of Michigan Business School. So it's great to see everybody. Uh, many of you I know. Uh, how many first timers are there here? Raise your hand, Marty, Bardner, okay, Al Blix, lots of good people. Elliot is going to be one of our speakers. So if there's a new people, um, you know, feel free to uh, ask questions and introduce one another. And come on in, come on in. I'll, I'll speak over here so people can get through. It's all right. Um, I'm okay, Roger. So uh, what I'd like to do, this is Leaders Connect. So we every month we have a presenter and uh, or presenters as today, and we try to keep people up to date about what's happening in not only Ann Arbor and Michigan, but in the in the fields. And today we have uh, some experts who are going to be talking about new media and what's happening there. So that's very exciting. And uh, we also uh, feature university professors. We have a few of those coming up. Uh, local newsmakers, whatever that may be. So uh, anyway, it's really really great to see everybody. And a couple of uh, one big thing about today that I'm very excited about is that. Uh, we have a new sponsor, and uh, the sponsor has put, put a few pens on your table, I think, so you can identify, but it's Bank of Ann Arbor, and uh, Bank of Ann Arbor uh, has been a great institution for the, uh, the city. How many of you are banking with Bank of Ann Arbor? Quite a few. Okay, so that could be your best salespeople for you, right? And uh, Bank of Ann Arbor specializes in banking with local companies, although they're not all local, they do a great job, and do a great job of promoting the city. So uh, their advertising campaign, of course, anybody remember of, you know, you're not from Ann Arbor, when, kind of, what's one of your favorites? Anybody remember one of those? Elephant ears. Pardon? Elephant ears. Elephant ears. <laughs> I don't know that one. <laughs> so um, I'm going to introduce Patty Judson, uh, who maybe could talk a little bit about the bank and your sponsorship. Good morning. As Rob said, I'm Patty Judson with the Bank of Ann Arbor. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, and I'm pleased to be here this morning to greet you. Bank of Ann Arbor has had a long-standing tradition of helping in the community, and for those of you that don't know a lot about us, we started in 1996 in a single location with 15 employees, zero customers, and zero funds on deposit. Uh, in today's day, we have uh, seven branch locations, nine ATMs, 180 employees, and in 2014 we crossed a billion dollar threshold. That would not be possible without the support of the communities we serve, and for that I offer a thank you. Um, we've got a long strand, standing tradition of supporting the community, and particularly the Ann Arbor community and the business community. So we're proud to be the sponsor this morning of the 2015 Leaders Connect series. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. And I know Janice Otring was supposed to be here this morning, but she had a little stepping accident with her foot and uh, just got out of surgery. So uh, all of you, please uh, watch your step. As you say. Get some of those cleats on your... I got some of those cleats, and one of these days I'm actually going to put them on my boots. So. <laughs> I feel like you're walking with a ski... Uh, like skis on, you know, ski boots. They make a lot of noise. So a couple other uh, in introductions I want to make. Uh, Elliot, you want to just stand up and uh, come on up over here? This is our speaker for next month, uh, one of the uh, the greatest. Uh, he, he loves up Mom and Ali. He is the greatest. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> professor at the School of Engineering at the University of Michigan, a premier professor. Maybe you could give a couple of the names that you've, uh, you've taught, who have launched uh, businesses, and maybe tell us what you're going to be speaking about next month. Sure. Actually, Larry Page was my student. Larry Page. Tony Fidel, uh, he and I started a company together. Then with Tony, he's the, the iPod guy, right? And the Nest guy, et cetera, et cetera. They're amazing kids. They're absolutely amazing. They're running the world, right? I mean, these two kids, right? They're running the world. Um, I'm at the University of Michigan in the computer science department. 
I'm also in the School of Education, School of uh, Information. I work with kids, K-12 in particular, and mobile devices. I work in Singapore, I go all over the world. We develop these wonderful tools for kids. Now, in America, it's really been a very difficult sell, to be honest. That's why I go to Singapore, because they say they want it, and uh, I'm going there. But I'm going to be talking about the kinds of technologies that we've been developing. You're all familiar with Web 2.0, which is really about asynchronous support for collaboration. We're dealing with social 3.0, so the next generation, which is synchronous collaboration. What we're doing here, but allowing you to do it with technology. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Maybe you could make us a test case and we could do it here. You know, that would be, that would be more. While we're talking about the university, Stuart here? Stuart? Yeah, Stuart. We have a, a, the new director of the Zeldori Institute who's, uh, who's been on about a year or so now. And uh, Stuart, maybe you could, I know you do a lot of connections with the community, so maybe you could talk about what's happening at Zeldori. Uh, thank you and good morning, and uh, as you mentioned, I've taken over from uh, someone many of you probably know from his years here in the community, Tom Kinnear. Uh, Tom started Zellori and uh, ran it for the last 14 years and then said uh, he still loves teaching but has had enough of the herding cats that involves uh, running a faculty group, so I was brought in a year and a half ago to do that. Uh, I'll say the key words now, out and about, so you all know where I came from. Uh, you may not have known this about Tom Kinnear, he was also a Canadian and uh, so I guess they had to recruit another one to come in to Zalori. I uh, look after uh, the student uh, commercialization fund, so uh, these two is the Frankel Fund, uh, teach at the school, uh, do personal angel investing, and, uh, and have a, a company down south that does some property management. So uh, lots of different points for involvement, and uh, like Elliot, work with uh, student entrepreneurs every day. It's, it's an incredible way to, to wake up and spend our days. Beats having a real job. I, I love that as well. And uh, look forward to meeting y'all. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. So uh, while we're uh, getting the mic back up, here we go. Part of the networking, when this group was a little bit smaller, we used to have everybody introduce to everybody. But right now, I just want you to introduce yourselves at the table. and. Uh, we want to uh, have you actually work on your elevator pitch. So uh, give your uh, elevator pitch to one another rather than just an introduction. So they kind of get enticed to want stairs. to work with you. And so the test of a good elevator pitch is if somebody says, oh, that's interesting, tell me more. So try it out with each other for about five minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back. And Kathleen, come on up. Uh, where's Kathleen? Kathleen, come on up and you can speak. All right, Patty, come on up. Go ahead and uh, introduce your yourself to each other at the table first. Go ahead. How are you? Good? How are you? Good. What did I miss? Hey, a couple introductions. Business is going well. Yeah. It's always rough to get up. At 6 o'clock in the morning. I've been playing basketball. Okay, we're going to come back. Uh, I wanted to make an introduction now. Uh, we have an opportunity. Hold on. Uh, every month, Leaders Connect features a not-for-profit uh, enterprise in the community that, is, that I, I think happens to be doing cool things and we try to uh, give them an opportunity to support, uh, to get support from all of you. We don't charge for this event uh, because our sponsors, uh, Bank of Ann Arbor and Zingerman's and Roger Rail, who does the video, uh, cover the cost and the, the facilities. But we do say, hey, if you want to make a contribution, uh, the featured uh, nonprofit would be a good place to do that. And today, uh, as many of you know, I'm a clinical psychologist and I've been working with, before I got into uh, doing organizational development and leadership training, I, I did work in the mental health area for over 25 years. And for those of you that read my Dr. Rob um, column on Mondays, I wrote this past week about why it is that we don't talk about mental health issues in the workplace, and specifically why people don't tell people that they are being treated for a condition. Uh, but everybody else knows in the, in the business. They all say, oh, so-and-so has such-and-such. But nobody ever says, 
hey, you know, how's it going with that? Now, if somebody has a, a bad back or they're, they're being treated for a condition, it's something that's often told in, in the workplace. So there's still this stigma, uh, and I think the stigma is worse among men, but it's, it's still there for women as well. And people are fearful of, of admitting that, or, or recognizing that there are health problems in the workplace. And one of the worst ones is depression. And one of the worst uh, outcomes of depression is suicide. So uh, today we're going to support um, the uh, a cancer research group. Uh, and Pat, you can maybe tell us more. So I want to introduce the executive director. Maybe you can say the right name of your organization so I don't get it wrong. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Good morning, everybody. My name is Pat Reinbelt, and I'm the executive director at the National Network of Depression Centers. And and it's it's kind of a, a secret in Ann Arbor that a national network of this caliber is right here in our own our own community. Um, our organization started with the University of Michigan, which had the first uh, depression center in the country, and their board thought. They're, we cannot do this alone. So they started the National Network of Depression Centers to encourage other academic medical centers to create these comprehensive centers that can do treatment, research, outreach, education, and to um, fight stigma. Um, one of the biggest things that we are working on and uh, one of the biggest reasons I joined the organization is we are building a registry of uh, patients to um, help our researchers find better treatments and also to provide quality care and standardized treatment for patients. We have 21 centers across the United States and we are growing. So check us out. We're at nndc.org. Thank So I'm going to get right into the program now, and uh, it's my pleasure to make these introductions. Why don't you ladies have your seats there, and we can start from there. And um, actually, I've known both uh, Liz and Molly for quite a while. Liz probably for the longest, because I knew her as a, like, a teenager when we first met. And she was... Uh, just a few short years ago. Just a few short years ago, raised by her parents, uh, her, her dad, Dave Ross, and her stepmom, Donna Freund. And uh, one of the interesting stories about uh, Liz that I was just telling Molly is that she actually is African American. And truly, because she was born in Kenya. And she was uh, conceived in, what, Chile or who knows, right? Somewhere. <laughs> but her parents were, uh, let's put it, they were among the generation in the 70s who decided to take a Volkswagen bus around the world. And they actually started in uh, California or someplace like that and found out they were pregnant, I know right at the beginning or whatever, and when they were got to Kenya, uh, they were ready to uh, say, well, this is a good place to have Liz come into the world. So are you a, a citizen then of Kenya? I am a yeah. dual, uh, dual citizenship, and actually we spent the first sort of 16 months of my life driving around through the Middle East. Uh, so I've been through Iran and Iraq, and my mom's, one of my mom's favorite stories is that she let a leper touch me and then decided that maybe that was like too much. Um, <laughs> so, Everybody has their lines. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm going to Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, uh, and, and then I've known Liz, and Liz has had a great career um, starting at Michigan State, right? We're a big, big Spartan fan. How many Spartan fans do we have? Are any Spartan fans? Yeah. All right, that's good, that's good. We can root for both teams except when they're playing each other. We have uh, Phil Brabs. Tell us your, your moment of fame, Phil. Oh, uh, 2002, made a kick against Washington in the last second in the big house. Okay, won the game. Won the game. We're, the Phil Brown, so we're not all Spartan fans here, but uh, <laughs> some of you probably remember that moment. But uh, we, uh, and then Liz went on to run many great concerns in the media business and has kept kind of growing in advertising. And she, she's now chief marketing officer for media brands. And she could tell us a little bit more about that. And then uh, Molly, I met when she was a friend. She's a friend of my son, Dan, who's getting married next month in Mexico. Mexico in uh, March. So, uh, and you guys work together at Amplifinity, right? We worked together at Hobbs and Black. Well, he was doing real estate. Yeah, okay. he was from McKinley and New York Architecture. I decided to go up and start a 
So Molly uh, worked at Amplifinity and then launched uh, her own business, Add Adapt, which she will be talking about. So she's a both local grown talent here. Um, Molly is working in Ann Arbor and hiring, and you've got some some of your board members here. I don't know if uh, Liz is a board member, and you've got some other pretty cool board members. And so, uh, and hopefully you bank the Bank of Ann Arbor, but I'm not going to ask, but you should be anyway. <laughs> bank of Ann Arbor, potential client. <laughs> Uh, no pressure, no pressure. So let me hand this over to you, and uh, you guys have till you know about an hour, hour and fifteen minutes or so, and then you know between everything, we'll, we'll try to wrap up before nine. But if people need to leave, uh, that's okay. We we understand. Uh, we have a lot of entrepreneurs and people who are leaders, but so and people who have golf outings today. So. <laughs> All right, well, I am going to stand up because I can't sit and talk, so I apologize if I move a little bit. Uh, no, so, you have to be not in front of the board, just for the video. So oh, oh, oh. Just to decide one way or the other. Sorry. All right, um, so thank you for having me. Hopefully, 7 30 a.m., Friday morning, it's freezing. Hopefully, there's been enough coffee. I know I downed a gigantic latte to make sure that I was able to do this this morning. Um, but honestly, we were going to talk about the future of media, but I'm actually going to talk really about sort of what's happening in the world, right? CES was two weeks ago. CES is the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas. Um, we do a gigantic event out there. So I'm gonna talk about sort of what are the trends that are happening in technology, which are really driving media, not the other way around. Um, so we'll dive into it and see where we go. So if we start, um, you can't unsee or you can't unhear what's happening with media. So who it can see or has seen this image before, but can see what's inside this image. Anybody see it? It's like it's like being. Remember the mall? Like you'd be at Briarwood, and they'd have those kiosks and those images, and they were like, "Just relax your eyes." I've never seen anything. I'm going to click really fast. What you see is that there's a dog there. Okay. So if you click again, now you cannot unsee the dog, right? So this is a little bit when I talk about the future of media, when I talk about what's happening in the world, you can't unsee it. So you have to fundamentally think differently about what you're doing, about what's happening, because you can't unhear. So if we go forward, this is actually one of my very favorite quotes. So I've worked in advertising for a long time, and I've worked in primarily the digital space, and I've always sort of been the kid under the stairs, because I work in these big agencies where a lot of people didn't understand technology. I was sort of the kid. Everybody was like, you know, that thing, that little internet thing, right? Change is the only constant. And this is Aaron, Eric Shinsiki's quote, obviously removed from the VA, but after a long and illustrious uh, career in the military. But you know, if you like, dislike change, you're really going to dislike irrelevance. And so the notion is get ready, right? So we're going to talk a lot about the pace of change, the acceleration of change, and how you should be thinking about how you change your own behavior in order to embrace what's happening next. There's one quick question. Is, is it okay if we give this? presentation to folks to, of course so, so I have to write everything out oh yeah please 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 send don't take it out notes. yeah on Monday um, yeah the, not only I'm there you'll get this presentation but I actually also have two white papers for you uh, the trends deck that we've published coming out of CES if we have time I'm going to go through the eight trends that we're seeing overall um, and I'm also going to give you a whole thing on over-the-top video uh, which is sort of changing the entire television landscape so it's another paper for you to look at um, actually, to go back really quick, um, who here has ever cooked a frog? No? Hey! Not very often do I hear someone's cook a frog. All right, so in order to cook a frog, if you, you put a frog in cold water and you slowly turn up the heat, slowly turn up the heat, and the frog will die. But if you put a frog in hot water, they jump out. This is a direct parallel to how humans think about change. And so the reality is, if something changes really dramatically, right, we all react, everybody gets all up in arms, but if things are happening incrementally, we oftentimes fail to notice the change. And it's a really interesting metaphor for us, right? If you think about right now, I know this morning I saw something on Facebook, 1,700 private jets flew to Davos to talk about global warming, right? <laughs> Irony abounds. However, you think about global warming, you think about some of the major issues affecting us, the slow incremental changes were really bad. And that's true for us in media, it's true for us in business. 
So we need to make sure that we're measuring and trying to capture those changes to make sure we don't lose sight of what's happening in the world. So before I talk about the future of media, we actually should go back really quick. So a little bit of a cautionary tale. Go one more forward, please. This is, does anybody recognize this? Probably not. This is the first banner that ever ran on the web. So last year, the banner turned 20 years old. 20 years old. So the first banner was launched in 1994. Uh, this was for AT&T. AT&T was a little uncomfortable with the whole concept, thought the internet might be a fad, so they didn't want to put their logo on it. <laughs> this ran on Wired, which was one of the first sort of online sites. And the whole idea was, you know, if you ever clicked on this space, you will. Actually, you won't, but say we were being very optimistic. I was part of the agency that launched this work. And so the idea was that we promised, we promised the right message to the right person at the right time. Go forward. And we all were sort of talking about how the world of media was going to change and you were only going to get advertising that was delivered to you and mattered to you and this was going to be this incredible revolution. Right, 1994, 1995. And if you go forward, what we did actually was fill the web with shit. Using a technical term. <laughs> it's really and we created just basically just a landscape of things that were meaningless. This actually, if I point to any company every time I speak, this is a website dedicated to all of those terrible lower my bills ads. Like this is their fault, right? The state of online advertising is totally lower my bills fault. And it's also this guy's fault. So I put this article here because you should read it because it's a fascinating start or article from The Atlantic. But this is a guy named Jesse Wilms, and he created this gigantic pyramid structure for all of that terrible advertising. So he's called the Dark Lord of the Internet. At one point, he had like $350 million. He had a private jet, and he had created this basically gigantic pyramid system where he ruined the Internet, essentially. So where do we go from here, right? First premise, so this is Wikipedia, this is supply and demand. I learned this at Sloss in junior high school in eighth grade, right? We totally ignored this. We basically pretended like we could create endless supply and it was gonna hold its value. Like, how silly are we? Like, we're just gonna basically ignore the economic principles that underpin our society? Like, hmm, probably not a great idea. So when you look at the internet today, and you look at media today, the major problem we have is that there is too much. There's just too much. So there is absolutely a case for creating scarcity. There's a case for less. Because fundamentally, if we continue to create more, it's going to be valueless. And the truth of it is, as people, and you can think about your own behavior, what's the last banner you clicked on? Right? Ever? And do you even see them? Right? So now, you think about opening your favorite web page. If it, the banner at the top said, Liz Ross, click here, $50,000, no strings attached. The chances of me clicking on that are nil. And the second piece is that I wouldn't even see it. I wouldn't even ever notice that it had run. This is a major, major problem for marketers. So, ultimately, what we forgot is that we're just talking to other people. So when I talk about media and I talk about advertising, I don't want to talk about it just in the stats of who's watching TV and how it's all working. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But when you're thinking about marketing and you're thinking about media and advertising, it's just this. It's just us trying to say, hey, you know what? I've got something really cool that I want you to take a look at. And because we've lost that, because we've tried to apply technology and algorithms to replace the idea that we're introducing something to another human being, we have lost our way. And stop. And I speak about it all the time. I'm part of a $35 billion media company. We spend about $35 billion of our clients' money on marketing. And I'm talking about this all the time. We have to remember that what we're talking to and what we're doing is trying to connect with other human beings. To be fair, where we are today, life used to be simpler, right? Everybody says this. But actually, if you're craft, and your marketing jello, you used to be able to go through a couple of channels, you sold it to a retailer, and that retailer sold it to a person. Very linear, very simple process. Disruption is happening in every single turn. So we'll start with the first one. Manufacturers have become media companies. So Coke has invested millions of dollars in becoming a studio. 
and they have something called Coke Studios, and they develop content around happiness and videos, and they become a media company. You've got BMW Films that underpins that that's doing the exact same thing. Media companies have become manufacturers. You head out to Best Buy, you walk in, what's the biggest thing you see there? You see Google. You see a whole section for Android and Chromecast. They become a manufacturer that's sitting inside a retailer. You've got, you've got Android, you've got Chromecast, that's what is happening. Media have become telecommunications companies or communications platforms. So Facebook bought WhatsApp for $19 billion. All, who, who in this room had ever even heard of WhatsApp or even knows, has heard of WhatsApp today? Okay, good. Go check it out. Go check it out. It's pretty amazing. It's cheap texting. It's all this. Cheap texting globally. So you don't have to use your phone plan. <coughs> but Facebook thought it was worth $19 billion. billion. Retailers have become manufacturers, so private label products have continued to accelerate. The nice brand at Walgreens, Kirkland at Costco. And then finally, retailers are becoming media companies. So you've got every retailer is trying to monetize their .com. So if you go on to target.com now, they're selling advertising space. So that is totally changing the world. But how do you think, what's media? Right, is all of this media, is none of it media? Walmart, so, I'll try, and I'm going to try to keep this presentation completely devoid of buzzwords and acronyms, but please stop me if I use one, because you can probably call bullshit on me. DSP is a demand-side platform, and what that means is that Walmart is using their data, so who buys products in their store, and they're selling that data to advertising to be able to target you. So they're actually creating a platform so that advertisers can buy their data. So again, another example of a, man, a retailer becoming a manufacturer of a media company. I love this chart. So this is the pace of change for technology innovation. You go all the way back, pottery, right? Everybody loves the invention of pottery. You go all the way through, right? You see really where that hockey stick starts? You start looking at the Watt engine, railroads, go into germ theory. This is only accelerating. There is no sign that this is slowing and that this sort of trajectory will continue. This actually comes from, and this is another citation that I'll give you guys in this presentation, probably one of the most amazing presentations I've seen in the last six months was from an or a guy who comes from an organization called Singularity University. So Singularity University is affiliated with NASA. It's not an accredited university because they change the curriculum too fast. Every quarter, they're changing the curriculum. And they had, it was founded by Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandi. So, futurist, money guy that funded Tesla and Elon Musk, right? Singularity University is looking at this pace, right? And they're part of the presentation that he gave. He started talking about um, the creation of the woolly mammoth. And this was recently on the cover of Time. Did you know that there will be a woolly mammoth walking on the earth within the next year and a half? Like, I thought we all saw Jurassic Park. I don't know. I mean, I thought we all saw the movie, we saw the ending, it was terrible. Like, why we're creating species from the end, I don't know. But that pace, right, that ability to go back and pull DNA and create a creature, to actually create a woolly mammoth, is really what is underpinning and driving what's happening today in technology, in research, and who we are as people. It's fundamentally changing who we are as people. And the final piece I'll put on this, the question that the speaker was asked was, how long until we're immortal? And I thought to myself, well, that's a question nobody can answer. And he said 17 years. And he said that by, in, within 17 years, science will be able to recreate healthy cells faster than disease can kill them. Just think about that for just pause on that for a moment. What the hell, right? So this... Away. This trajectory isn't just about launching a new iPhone. This trajectory is going to change the course of humanity. Absolutely change the course of humanity. Okay. The most important thing I'm going to say all day, so all of that, before we talk about the future of media and what's happening, the most important thing to never forget is that everyone just wants to be loved. Everyone. Everyone in this room. We want to be heard. We want to be respected, we want to be liked, we want someone to laugh at our jokes. Everyone just wants to be loved. 
And so when I'm working in, with clients and advertising, and all of these things, I always try to bring it back to, let's just remember, everyone wants to work. Okay, so let's talk about the future and where we are really today. So coming off of CES, and again, we'll talk a little bit about the trends that we saw there. We've been talking about a lot of this future state stuff for a really long time. So I mentioned the banner is 20 years old. I was part of the first digital agency called Modem Media, which was based out in Connecticut. And we were talking about the connected home. We were talking about your living room, talking to your fridge, which would connect to your toaster in the morning. And it seemed silly. And coming out of CES this year, our overall theme and our overall sort of takeaway is that the future has been both realized and implemented. So today, you are seeing these things connect together. So about a year ago, I bought a device called Automatic. Have you guys seen the Automatic? So an Automatic is a device you buy, you plug it into this port in your car that you would have no idea was there until you sort of get underneath. And it's what the dealer uses to diagnose what's happening in your car when you get an engine light. You plug this device in, and what it does is connect into your engine and your iPhone, and it's an app, right? And it tells you how you're driving, could you be more fuel efficient, is there a check engine light, it also tracks where you parked your car, which is really helpful in Chicago, because oftentimes you forget. And as you're, as you're sort of driving, so this automatic, I have connected into my car. At Christmas time, I installed and connected the Nest, the monitor. Right? So did it myself, had no idea I would ever be able to wire a thermometer, unbelievably easy. Connected in the, th the Nest thermometer. At CES, Nest and Automatic announced that you could connect the two together. So I have it on a second house that's here in Michigan, the Nest thermometer. And so I now have had it set so that when my car passes the Costco in Mishawaka, it turns on the house. How crazy is that, right? I mean, you really think about it and you're like, wow, like my car turns on the heat. So when I get there, my one-year-old isn't waiting for the house to heat up while he's crawling around on the floor. That notion of being implemented and realized is absolutely happening today. The future starts at your house. So when you're thinking about the future of media, it's at your house and it starts in your living room. Go for it. There has been, so this is television. So we've had about 70 years of linear television. There has been shockingly little innovation. So it started actually with Philip Morris and the soap operas, right, where it was brought to you, a single program was brought to you by one advertiser. <laughs> and then we moved into the commercial interruption, which is sort of, we call them pods. They're the pods of, of advertising, those places that you ignore. Those pods and that sort of linear, numbers-based system has not changed in 70 years. And what we've done is apply that same model to every channel that's come after it. So what we've done is taken the internet, right? Even with online video, you put that same, those same terrible ads that run before or in the middle or at the end where you get so irritated, right? Same model. Like we've done no, very little innovation in 70 years. So a little bit of sort of where we're at with television is our fault. Like we've sort of ignored it and sort of it's been this juggernaut. And there are billions, with a B, of dollars that are spent today on, on, on television advertising in what's called the upfront. So we all get together, happens around April and May, all the television networks trot out all their celebrities, we all pose on red carpets with the Bravo people. And then we plunk down $100, $200 million at a time to buy that space. And the reality is, if you think about your own television viewing habits, nobody's watching. DVR penetration is at 50%. 50%. And don't tell me that once somebody gets a DVR, they're still interested in watching commercials. They're not. They're not. And the only, only, only exception is live sports or tentpole events like the Oscars. And so when you think about that shift, and you think about billions, billions and billions of dollars being spent on something that doesn't make a difference, we have to, have to make a change. Something has to, has to happen. So what we're seeing is that 
people are buying less TV. So what's actually happening is advertisers are not buying less television spend. People are buying less of it. This is, I think, one of the most amazing stats. This is 2012, so you think we're three years past this, so you can only imagine this number is getting worse. 3.2 million new homes. Only 250,000 of them signed up for cable. Think about that. A little melodramatic music. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice touch. And if you go forward, actually, what you'll see, and again, you'll get this, is that this is the long, sad goodbye of cable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the companies everybody loves to hate, right? If you look between March 12, 2012 and March 2013, they lost 1.2 million households. The reason why your cable bill goes up and up and up is because there are fewer and fewer people subscribing. So the real question is, why do you still have cable? So one of the big announcements at CES was the Dish Network had launched something called Sling. And Sling is actually a partnership with the NFL. Because the reason why I still have cable is my husband is a diehard sports fanatic. And would die. He would literally just shrivel up and die. And he couldn't watch the Cubs, the Bears, the Blackhawks. So that is the last bastion that is holding the cable companies together. Literally the last one. And it's gone. And it's going fast. The other shift is from, again, I love this, uh, desktop to mobile. So what you're seeing is people are shifting away from having a desktop computer. Nobody wants them anymore. It's almost like the furniture when you needed a huge armoire for your TV. Like all of that sort of surrounding need for that is going away. Because you're going to be able to, and you can do it today, you can plug your laptop into your gigantic television. Why do you need yet another monitor sitting on yet another desk with a printer and a fax? So this is happening. This is why companies like Dell are in trouble. And actually, it's why companies like Microsoft are in trouble. And this other major shift is that we have moved from channels. So think about the last time you ever said, I'm going to go watch something on ABC. Ever? Right? Ever? To content. And so instead of saying, I'm going to go watch a channel, you are now able to say, I want to watch a movie about zombies. And then you can come up with everything that's zombie-based. And you can come up with it on demand. You can come up with it on all of the over-the-top services like Hulu and Netflix. So you've shifted from channels to content. And these stats are amazing. When you hear the stats about the amount of video uploaded to YouTube every second, it is astonishing, astonishing. The 89 million people in the US will watch 1.2 online videos a day. And if you look at the percentage of mobile traffic, 50% of the traffic online on mobile devices will be video by 2017. And actually, Facebook today, so we just came off of huge meetings with Facebook in Vegas, they are delivering more online video than YouTube. And 50% of it is delivered without sound. So when you're scrolling through your Facebook feed and the video starts to play, right, you sort of watch it, you don't want to turn the sound up because you're in a meeting and you're like, well, that's embarrassing. But you sit there and watch it. 50% is delivered without sound. Absolutely changing the landscape of how people are consuming content. They're consuming smaller amounts of it and they're consuming it more frequently. So the days of sitting down and getting a bucket of popcorn or TV dinner and watching an hour-long show was a really, really small. Really, really small. And they're going, they're going to continue to get smaller and smaller. Over the top video, <coughs> OTT. I mentioned this at the very beginning. I'm going to give you a white paper on this. This is the buzzword that everybody's talking about. It is the idea that content is being delivered over the top of linear television. So when you think about your smart TV, your connected TV, Chromecast, this is content that comes up and over, but it's delivered on your television screen. So Hulu, iTunes, etc. those are the services that are delivering it. This is the devices that are delivering OTT content. So what you see here um, on the bottom are Xbox and PlayStation. So people think those are just gaming systems for 17-year-old boys. They're not. The average gamer, by the way, is 29. Um, so 
not 17 and not living in their mother's basement. Although maybe in their mother's basement would be negative. So. <laughs> I don't know what the experience as everybody else is having, but I do know that when I graduated from college, my dad told me I had a week. <laughs> I don't know what he told me that. The last piece here in yellow, which is where you see all the bars, are smart TVs. Every TV that's sold today, almost every TV has some component part that is smart. It's actually very hard to buy a TV that's not connected. It actually takes real effort. Underneath here, what you're seeing are the services that are delivering. So if you've ever heard anyone talk about Apple TV, Roku, Android TV, Amazon Fire, or the Xbox, those are the platforms that you're able to, again, so simply, none of this is complicated, which is actually has been long been the barrier to connect these things to your TV and it delivers you the content you want. One plug-in. So it's not like the old days of Microsoft where you're in the drivers and downloading. It was like this nightmare of, of connection. These things connect directly. And so this is over-the-top content delivered through your TVs. Okay, let's look at the number wrap-up. First one, TV subscription. So I mentioned that if you still have cable, you're becoming a rarity, an absolute rarity. We'll plateau this year at 104 million households. 104 million. So you think about 300 million people, there's about 150 million households. That number's continued, and that's declining. So that's not on the way up, that's not very much on the way down. OTT platform, platforms are growing fastest by millennials who are not signing up for cable TV. So when they rent a new apartment, their first call is not to the cable company, it's to the Best Buy to grab their Roku box. It's all they need. Smart TV footprint is expected to rise from 45 million to 78 million by 2018. So you think about the number of TVs, average home is about two and a half TVs. It's about, so you're looking at that footprint rapidly expanding. Vizio, brand everybody's probably heard of, low cost, entry point television for people that are looking for a, a cheap TV, estimates that 60% of their TVs shipped today are smart TVs. So this is not a, the wealthy will have these connected homes. This is, this is everybody, top to bottom. December 2014, so just the month that just passed, connected games consoles will be 88 million homes. So again, remember these aren't just playing Call of Duty while someone's eating Cheetos in a basement. These are actually streaming content. These are actually driving connected homes. And the Xbox Connect, right, the camera that allows you to connect, that actually is driving home security systems as well. It's what Microsoft is trying to own that connected home in their last gasp of relevance. And then finally, the 2014 footprint of uh, the over-the-top devices is going to be about 47 million, which is up 100% over last year. So when you're thinking about people that have a Roku device or Apple TV, so I just want to pause there for a minute, because we've talked about a ton. Questions? Thoughts? Any buzzword I use that you don't know, or any word that, anything I talked about that seemed off? Well, I have one back here. Sure. What I'm seeing is basically consolidating in the industry with the vertical integrated, yep. which is what you've been describing, yep. which is what the auto industry did, yep. and great things came from it until the sheer complexity of the bureaucratic process kills creativity and those companies begin to fail. Do you see any of that happening? So, so for those who enjoyed the country music, um, you couldn't hear the question. The um, question was about sort of vertical consolidation and does that kill creativity similar to what happened in the auto industry? Um, I think what has happened, so it's a great question, and actually if you look at what's happened on the internet, that consolidation has very much happened. So if you look at Facebook, for example, even though Facebook is older than people think and there's always uh, some article about how teens don't like Facebook, they use Instagram, which by the way, owned by the same people. <laughs> so the, the vertical integration that's happened on the internet has happened. So you've got Facebook, you've got Netflix, and they are controlling a gigantic percentage of the web traffic. And actually the company that has sort of lost out, although it's hard to, hard to say they've lost when their valuation is what it is, but the company that is sort of most grappling with where do they go next is Google. And Google has built its entire business on indexing 
the traffic of the web, and a huge percentage of the web traffic, upwards of about 60%, is invisible to Google. Google can't index Facebook. It just shows up as one site. So when you think about that consolidation, it's happened. Where I think we will avoid the auto industry sort of killing of creativity in those terrible, terrible cars is that we're operating in a very global economy. And that's different from where we were when the consolidation happened in the US automakers and then the challenges came from Germany and Japan. Because of where the manufacture of these devices happening is very global. So if you look at a company like Samsung, Samsung is, I mean, if you ever want to just be interested, one of the largest companies you will ever start to explore when you look at what their portfolio of products is, it is amazing. It's a Korean company, right? So their level of sort of consolidation and interest is going to continue to push devices forward to make sure that Apple, and they've done a good job, Apple has not cornered or consolidated the device-based market because they have Samsung right there pushing them, and they're not bound by whether US development or, so everybody is really, I think, I think the global economy helps us, but it's absolutely something that's gonna be a big watch out. Yeah? I, I can back that up because I'm in the auto industry, so and, uh, we were all running around Samsung's booth and Apple's booth to see a uh, show. And it, it, it's funny to see some people enjoy baseball hats or Michigan cats. Didn't see a lot of Michigan State cats. <laughs> <laughs> we were all at the bowl game. Is that what you were? <laughs> Oh, sorry. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Do you want to repeat the question? Because they couldn't. Just go ahead. No, uh, I just wanted to uh, say basically what you're saying with the automotive. Just wanted to back it up. So he was just reaffirming that where sort of where things are happening was uh, was consistent in the auto. Since I think we might have better just hold a question so later so we can pass the mic. Maybe you can just get through and then we can okay. Yes. It's, 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 we want to pick it up on the video, which is going to be on YouTube. Uh, the only thing loaded t tomorrow will be this presentation. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, we can't so do anything about the music. I hope you like the choice. <laughs> yeah. Is it like a, so? I'll just keep humming like slowly. <laughs> all right, so we'll move forward, and then we'll catch your question. Um, we'll keep going. All right, so. Molly is actually going to talk about the world of mobile and talk about the world of apps. Sure. Don't, stop Don't stop talking. Just keep, keep talking. talking. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah. So uh, my expertise is in apps. So we help apps advertise. Oh, sorry. Switching again. I thought you were just waiting. Mm -hmm. at <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So real quick, about about fifty percent of the time that. I'm sorry, about 50% of Americans now have smartphones, and I would guess that the percentage in this room is much higher because um, nobody is over 90 or under 10, let's say. So uh, everybody has smartphones, and we are spending more time on those smartphones than we are anywhere else, so more than TV, more than radio. And then about 88% of the time that we are on our smartphones, we're in apps. So a while ago, people were debating, are people going to open that web browser more, or are they going to start going to all the different apps that they have on their phone, and apps have won. For a while, um, Google was one of them. They were coming out with stats, basically trying to sway people to say, hey, no, you know, it's 50-50, some people like apps, some people like web, because it would be a lot easier for them um, if everybody liked web. But turns out, everybody likes apps, so they sort of won that battle. Um, but one thing that's really interesting about that is what apps. So what apps are people going to? How do people find apps? Discoverability is a really, really hard thing to get a handle on. Next one. So there are millions of apps, right? Like, like way too many that, that people can really get a hold on. Um, Google has a ton of them. iTunes now has 1.2 million apps that you can download right now in the App Store. Um, I think the percentage has actually gone down for how many apps are only open once. Um, I think it's a... Yeah, it's gone down a little bit, but it's still still a large percentage. So there's a lot of apps that are sort of dead on the iTunes store that people might download once, never open again, that are sort of live. Um, do you think this is a good time for the activity, or should I wait for the next? Okay, okay. Um, so you can see that the losers in this battle uh, of you know 
what operating systems people are going after are the ones that can't have a lot of apps because those are what, what are leading our lives. So Blackberry, Windows, Phones, Amazon, they're not doing that well in the, in the app game and so they're not doing very well in the popularity game as well. Is anybody here on a Blackberry? Sorry. <laughs> no one, really? Okay. So the other thing that's really interesting to look at um, that we are focused on is how do these apps make money? Um, so about 20% of the time that you're using your phone, you're in an app that simplifies your life. This is where we're targeted at, so um, I might talk a lot about that. But we call them task-based apps. They might be your calorie trackers. They might be the apps that help you organize your calendar. They might be the apps um, that you make your grocery list on. The only way that these apps can even compete at all for getting downloaded is they have to be free. I mean, if you're not free, you're not even going to get on people's radar. So then what happens? So if you download a grocery list and it's free, how are these apps going to make money? If they have new features, if they have developers, if they want to do cool things, it's really, really difficult and it's a major problem. Um, so out of those 1.2 million apps that are on iTunes, over 90% are free. Um, by 2018, that's supposed to jump to about 95%. So it's causing a major issue, uh, but it is making a good economy. That's my phone. That's really embarrassing. <laughs> I'm speaking. I deserve it. I totally deserve it. Um, so, so all of a sudden you see like this really great intersection for advertising to be able to come in, but those, the way that advertisers connect with apps has not been figured out. Um, the predominant model right now is banner ads. I think you know we talked earlier about banner ads. Nobody wants to click on them. Advertisers are starting to get savvy, saying that they don't really want to pay for them since nobody's clicking on them. Um, app developers are seeing that there's stats that show people will leave their apps if they're bombarded with advertising. So it's created this kind of crazy ecosystem of everybody's using them, everybody's on them, advertisers want to be in them, and nobody really knows how to connect the dots. Um, so yeah, so I'll give myself a little bit of a plug. <laughs> um, so at, at Adapted, what we do is we work with these app developers. One thing that app developers are really great at is designing ads in their apps. So they're really good at saying, you know, hey, this format might be kind of crazy to you advertisers, but we know the perfect place to reach our audience. We know how to design an ad that looks and feels like the app environment. It's not going to be too intrusive, but it fits into the way people are using our apps. We also know the kind of content that they want to engage with. Um, so it's great. We have this perfect situation figured out. But the problem is most advertisers are like, hey, that's awesome, but we also want sophisticated targeting and tracking with like a little account management to go with it so we're not just throwing money at you. And if we're going to take all the time to make this deal, we'd really like to reach you know, tens of millions of users for the effort that it took to talk to you, um, which most app developers don't have on their own. So what we do is, is we go around and find all this really cool inventory. Um, we templatize it so we know what those environments look and feel like, and we're able to put assets in them, serve them down, native experience. And what you see when you do that, when you actually integrate into these app environments, people will take the time to look at them. They'll take the time. Um, to notice what brand brought it to them, and it's really great in terms of performance beyond the click. It increases brand favorability, increases brand perception, brand awareness. Um, so that's the world we play in. I'll hand it back to you. All right. All right, so I mentioned CES, and I mentioned there's eight trends coming out of CES that we're watching. I'm going to give you guys way more detail on this, but I'm just going to touch on them really quickly. So the first, um, that's exciting, just mobile platform. There is actually some. Um, okay, so what it is is that the connected car is the next mobile platform. So when you walk through the CES floor, as you'll know as a, as a car guy, the car companies have dominated. They've taken real estate that once used to be um, in Intel, it used to, uh, uh, used to be dominated by the technology companies, is now looking at is, is all cars. So I bought a new car two years ago. My car actually has a hotspot. It is, integrates with Google Earth. And so that notion is that your car is a mobile platform is real. And it's only going to continue so as you're able to download content, et cetera. And, that, and accidents, yeah. That's the scary part. Self-driving car, no accidents. That's right. And actually... You're going to trust that one. So if you ever want to laugh till you cry and your stomach hurts, go watch the online videos of being inside the Google car, self-driving car. It's the scariest thing. These people are screaming. The car is driving around really fast. I honestly cry 
But that car has driven 500,000 miles without an accident. 500,000 miles in California where people are terrible, terrible drivers. So that idea of the self-driving car, again, a reference back to Singularity University, that's real. That is real. That is not sort of a silly pipe dream, but yeah, honestly, go watch that video, you'll cry laughing. The second part, and I've talked a little bit about the connected home, the smart home is relevant and it's real. And so last year at CES, I made a ton of jokes about the washer that has like a screen on it. And I kept saying to myself, like if any advertiser says to advertise to me when I'm doing my laundry, unless you're saying to me I'm sending you free detergent, like I'll never ever buy your product again. But that idea is real. I'm connecting in, my washer is going to talk to my app of my grocery list, which Ad Adapted will have filled with native, perfect advertising for me. That, that's real. That is absolutely real and coming in. The other big thing that was the funny joke from last year was the fork that would tell you when to stop eating. It would vibrate and tell you you had too many calories. It would not work here, by the way. The shift towards content, so again, away from the idea of where we're delivering things, incredibly irrelevant. It doesn't matter if you're watching it on linear television, over the top, through your Facebook feed on the phone, it's just content. So content has been dis connected or disembodied, if you will, from the device upon which it's been delivered, and that is the first time that we're really, really seeing that happen. Has everybody heard of Oculus? Yep, some hands. So Oculus is the gaming company that's this gigantic thing that you wear around your head. It looks ridiculous. However, it delivers a really unbelievable online gaming experience, and that is continuing to advance. So they're going to move it so it's not, again, some gigantic thing strapped to your head that you look um, utterly rid ridiculous, but when you walked around those booths, virtual gaming and reality are being connected in new ways that you've never seen before. The, there was an entire area of CES that was moved out of the six football fields of content that is about wearables. So, anybody have a Jawbone or a Fitbit on? Some? Yep. I love my Fitbit. That had sort of always been the uh, the trackers, right, the wearable trackers, so you're looking at pedometers, basically how many steps you're taking, how many calories you're eating. The transition is happening, so if you think about the Apple keeps talking about their iWatch, right, the iWatch, it's transition to jewelry. So if you, th and beautiful jewelry too, not terrible, terrible jewelry. Jewelry that will tell you when your phone is wrong, when you've got a message. So if you're sitting in a meeting and your wedding ring lights up, you know, <laughs> it's gone, it's gone. That notion of wearable technology is driving and underpinning our desire to do something we're calling the Miko system, which is doing self-tracking data about ourselves. So people are tracking how they're sleeping, how they're eating, how they're exercising, how they're walking, and you're going to be wearing things that are going to be baked into your clothes and into your jewelry and into your devices that are going to increasingly allow you to monitor and judge your own things. In fact, Google, I think, is funding this, but there are contact lenses that are going to monitor your blood sugar. So if you think about the idea of not having to think about diabetes, think about the prevalence of diabetes for us culturally and as our, our population ages, your contact lenses are going to be able to connect with your ring on your finger to tell you when you need an insulin shot. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. This is the one I'm so sad about. <laughs> so sad about selfies. I've never taken a selfie, I'm so proud to say. Selfies are here to stay, and they are absolutely, there's something new called the selfie stick. Has everyone seen the selfie stick? It's the worst. I can't, just can't, it's unbelievable. If there were people walking around CES, filming themselves, looking at CES, I was like, what? Oh, it's colliding. Selfies are sort of a part of a generation that is looking to capture their experiences in ways that don't make sense to any of us. And when I talk about it going to new heights, what people are now doing are using drone technology to film what's happening in the world around them. So drone technology, if you actually all those Facebook videos we talked about over Lake Michigan this year in Chicago where it froze over and it was 20 below, there were drones flying up and down Lake Michigan as people filmed the lake freezing. Right? That notion of sort of the expanded video selfie is going to continue. You've seen this year we've had probably the most data breaches that we've ever had. 
So when you think about the target breach, right, where all of us were issued new credit cards, you look at the um, Sony hack, right, that we all sort of laughed at but secretly thought, dear God, if my email ever got out, like how embarrassing would that be? People have become the new cookies. So biometrics are becoming the security device that is going to protect us at some level. And I'm sure there's, fa there's failability in all of the systems. But the notion that you're going to use your thumbprint to connect and protect your data is real. And so data is incredibly valuable. Your data is incredibly valuable. And continuing to figure out how to protect that is going to, is going to be a huge business. And then finally, and this is actually probably the biggest thing that is that no one's talking about, but that power is the currency. So you think about walking around an airport and looking for the plug, right? And there's always like three other iPhones plugged in. You're like, ah. you're walking, looking for the next. So they launched, there's a suitcase that somebody launched that actually has power built in. So you just plug your devices into your suitcase and it powers up. Power is currency, and there's a ton of development around wireless charging so that if you came into this restaurant, you'd be able to put your device down and it would charge. But that is the sort of biggest sort of infrastructure development that will happen over the next 12 months. All right, can't unsee the dog. Everybody remember the dog? All right, so what should you do? So what are the things that, and we'll get through this really quick, we'll take questions, and then we have a quick exercise if we have time. Experiment relentlessly. So when you are seeing something new, you see a new technology, Twitter comes out, and some of your kids are like, this is so cool, and you're like, oh, can't deal. Get on it. Get on it. Just try it out. Experiment. See what's out there. Try new stuff. Because it's, it's interesting, and it will drive sort of what's happening. But you can't, you can't learn it from afar. you got to just get in, and you got to experiment. Use data where you can, but be really, really skeptical. So if you get, go forward, this is my, one of my favorite things. So Experian is the company that has been tracking all of your credit card data for the last 75 years, right? Everybody gets all up in arms about Facebook tracking your stuff. Uh, Experian has what you bought and knows exactly who you are. They launched a site called all, allaboutthedata.com. You guys need to go today. Because here's what they did. They created the site. You log in all your information, your social security number, or stuff. Don't worry, they already have it anyway, so you don't have to feel uncomfortable. And they tell you what they know about you. Unbelievable. They tell you where they know about the data, what they're, sc what they're skewing from Facebook, what catalogs you've bought from, what they can tell based on your purchase history. Fascinating. But when I say be skeptical, so I was so excited to go to this site when it launched the first day I was on it. They have my household income is $35,000. Now, I work in advertising, so it's not much more, <laughs> but it's not $35,000. And they said on the site, hey, tell us, update it. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I get no credit card solicitations, right? I get very little mail. Somebody named Marcus Ross apparently lives at my house, gets like the black card Amex and stuff like that. But you find out what they know, but do know that data is failable, fallible. And in fact, they have my mortgage. And unless they thought to themselves, I'm a drug dealer, <laughs> there's no way those two things are working together, right? <laughs> so clearly there is issues in the data. But go, allaboutthedata.com. Ask your customers how they want to be talked to. Remember my everyone just wants to be loved? Ask them. Ask when you're thinking about marketing, you're thinking about media, ask people how they want to be talked to, but be wary. Here's my second funny story. Focus group participants were asked to create the most beautiful painting in the world. This is what they created. Now, there's nothing horrible here. I mean, it could be hanging on the wall of a very cheap hotel. But what you see here is that, so they worked with an artist, right, who talked about a landscape and peaceful, and then clearly somebody said, well, something historical would be nice. So you've got George Washington, <laughs> very strange. So he's like, well, you know, paintings aren't paintings unless it's something about family. So you've got a nice modern family walking. And then my favorite is the Jesus deer walking on the water. So again, nothing offensive here, but this is not art. So when you're thinking about creating great marketing, it is about creating a piece of art. It's about creating something that connects to another person on a visceral level. 
and it has to have you in it. You can't have somebody tell you what they want. If we all told Apple what we wanted in a phone, they never would have come up with one button. And by the way, neither would have we. And finally, you are a consumer, so use the media. Never advertise in a vehicle that you don't use. So I bust our clients all the time on this. When they say, well, I'm using, I need to buy a big buy in television. And I'm like, awesome, what's the last television ad you saw? They don't. And by the way, the agency doesn't either, so I bust our own people doing this. Use the media, and if it's something that you don't value or use, don't use it. Don't use it, you have to live it. You have to live it, you have to believe in it. Otherwise, it really, really doesn't matter. And the final quote is Alvin Toffler. He is a futurist. He talks about that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write. It is those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Every month, we're getting a new update on the Apple OS, right? And you're learning something new, and it's so frustrating. Where did that thing go? That is the new literacy. It is the ability to unlearn, and it's the ability to adapt. So instead of turning on your television and ABC pops up and you use the channel up and down, you're going to get a screen that tells you where do you want to get your content. It's okay. It's just change, right? Remember the very beginning, change is that constant. Change is the only thing that you can actually count and rely on. And that is it. So there are some resources here. We have uh, the presentation as well as um, both Molly and my email, our Twitter handles for all of you guys that are on Twitter. And if not, please go and register today. And we'll give you those white papers as well as a copy of the presentation. Do the exercise. Uh, I think we should do the exercise. Uh, people, people can actually question you. Oh, you're hard here. One thing I was curious about, how many people are taking their notes on their handheld device? What, what app are you using? Notes. Notes? Okay. Index cards. <laughs> I realize I'm using Evernote, and I'm using my to-do list, that you said. So it's, it's you know, you message yourself. This is my handheld device. Right, Molly, you want to hand it Yeah. So this is just a real quick exercise. Um, so like I said, I'm guessing that, that in this room most people have smartphones. It's okay if you don't. That's right. So at your table, we wanted everybody to talk really quickly about two apps on their phone. The first one is the app that you use most. So tell the table the app that you're pulling up every day, maybe how often that you use it, and just sort of compare. You know, is everybody using their phone in the same way? And then the second one that I wanted you guys to talk about is if you have an app on your phone that you think maybe people don't know about. Um, discoverability is a huge thing. A lot of times people don't find out about apps unless a friend tells them because where else do you find it? So if there's an app that you think is really cool, tell your table about it. Um, and at the end, we can, we can talk if there's any cool discoveries. So take five minutes and go for it. You have that Opportunity did did any table find out about a new app that they didn't know about that they want to that they want to introduce to the whole group? So kind of like a funneling system of what what are the best of the best of the apps that you guys find out found out about? Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Card Crunch is one you take a picture of a, uh, of a business card. It goes into your LinkedIn. Card Crunch? I think it's Card. Crunch. Oh, that sounds very cool. I got to use that this morning. That would be great. Okay. Any other ones that we didn't know about? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one of the speakers from last year, uh, Vic Spector, wrote a book called uh, On Purpose. Okay. And he has an app that's related to that, which is uh, uh, kind of journaling. Okay. Journaling app. Uh, on Purpose is what it's called? Okay. It's just, is it easy to use? Is that what makes it? Okay. That's one of those things. I always have my mobile device on me, and so I use Evernote a little bit, but anything that can make it easier to capture these things and record them and, and keep them and take and find them again is it's great. Okay. Anyone else have a? Go ahead. Clear. Clear. Yeah, clear is pretty awesome. Clear is just a list maker, but it's the easiest to use. You can use your voice with it, and then you can prioritize it. So you can move it around. So I don't want to pick up my 
you know, groceries till later, I can move it down to the bottom of the list and do whatever I have to do right now up to the top. So I'm always going to priority. Uh, yeah, we were talking about password. You know, yeah. we'll keep your passwords in an app, yeah. and a couple of us are using a couple I live and die by my last pass. Um, I have that app, right? So I started on desktop, and especially with the iPhone 6s, you can use your thumbprint to get all your passwords. And so now, I mean, how many times have you tried to get into an app and you abandon it because it asks for your password, and you try the first three versions that you can think of, and then you can't, and then you can So last pass is awesome because, especially on the iPhone 6, because you use your thumbprint to get it, you can copy it right from that app so it's secure in that way, and then you bring it over to your other apps and just press paste, and it makes it a lot easier. Um, Everything that I've read about them recently says that that's actually a lot more secure than what everybody else is doing, putting them on Excel sheets and trying to do their own encryption that only they know, but isn't really that hard to figure out. Um, so things like LastPass are actually pretty popular, yeah. If there aren't, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Site, it's a new aggregator site, and select the topics that you're interested You said Zite? Z-I-T-E. Z-I-T-E, okay, news aggregator. The other one that um, is really popular right now is Feedly. I don't know if anybody uses Feedly. You guys do? So uh, I'll look up. It's like Feedly is the new uh, Google reader, right? So when Google Zara says feeder stop, uh, Feedly became the really great mobile version. So you can just follow your favorite news topics, pull up one app, and they're all aggregated for you. So that's cool. Feedly is uh, F-E-F-E-E-D-L-Y. Yep, yeah, good. Just a fun one is Waze, W-A-Z. Oh, yeah. Real time, it'll do it. Drive it, it'll do it. It's like, you know, it's the best part is the police. They literally will save you from every speed trap. I'm going to see them coming. It's amazing. I'm going to have to try that. I've heard that's been in the news a lot. Yeah. 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 Ye
and it was just pretty basic content. But um, and then we also ran a gift guide for them this last Christmas. So quick, easy, digestible things that get people's attention usually works for us. Other questions? Yep. Oh, Hi, I'm in the hospitality industry, and I'm old, and my customers are not old. You said don't use apps that or any type of advertising that you don't. There's lots I don't know about and don't know. So talk to me about about not advertising in places that I don't already use. You're only as old as you feel, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I only feel 23, so I'm holding on to that. That's where I'm staying. Um, I think the idea is that I would encourage you to, to, to try stuff. And to go out if you are interested in online advertising, if you're interested in looking at YouTube or Twitter or those things, there's no, these things aren't that complicated actually. They, they appear to be at the beginning, but they're actually not that hard. Um, and if, if something stumps you, there's always going to be somebody around you that can say, all right, just spend 10 minutes with me and walk me through what this is like. Because in order for you, I think, to think about how you maximize it or have ideas about how the best way is, you have to have used it. You really do. I think it's, it, make, it's the more, it makes it more powerful. So I don't think there's an age limit on any of this. And I think that it really is just about trying new stuff out. It's about, you know, downloading these apps, looking at stuff. Um, you're never going to know everything. I certainly don't. But it's, it is that willingness to try. Liz, can I, uh, one more thing that I tend to do? Let me just follow the microphone. Um, one of the, I'm always big about when I work with my coaching clients, okay, we had this nice conversation. What's one action step you're going to take based on this? So can they take five minutes at the table and everybody just think for a, a minute, one to do, you could write it down on paper, which is really you know, cool, or you could write it on an app, or you, but what you can't do is just remember it because your brain is so, so 20th century, you know. And, uh, but just share with each other one to do and then it might be interesting when Elliot comes in next month, and Elliot's presentation will overlap a lot with this because he's in this same world. And maybe people could share kind of like, okay, I said I was going to do this, I did it, and here's how my life has, has changed. I've dropped 20 pounds, I'm running a triathlon, and I'm remarried. You know? I wasn't even divorced. <laughs> so go ahead and just take a few minutes, and then uh, you know, to-dos, and then we'll maybe ask people to, say, to share, give some feedback to Liz and... Molly about what their takeaways are from this, okay? To share, what are what are the, the best of the uh, the action items? Uh, Derek, you, you must have a good one. You're on top of the stuff. This is Derek Maribond. Who tell them about what you do, guys? Wednesday, where a lot of this is covered every yeah. Wednesday at the pub, right? Yeah, no, you guys. Some a lot of you come out to uh, LA2M. It's a marketing education group that runs every Wednesday at lunchtime. And uh, it kind of runs here. So Derek, what's your to do today? My to do actually is I'm gonna I'm gonna set up that last pass. I've been avoiding that, just I haven't done it. But yeah. setting up just the password button, uh, system like that, I need to do. Okay, so uh, from the youngest person in the audience, I don't know who the youngest is, but have we got anybody in their twenties here? Twenties. <laughs> All right, what are you gonna do? Uh, to echo what he said, last pass, I really need to get on that. I've okay. been putting it out as well. I don't know if I was uh, yeah. worried about what they could do with it, but it seems like everyone who used it uh, has great things to okay. say about it. If you let your last pass to El Paso, that's a Willie Nelson song. You might want to check out too. Uh, and uh, it's interesting in terms of the 20s. Uh, another data point that I read about this week on one of my feeds is that this week uh, we passed millennials now outnumber baby boomers. This is a turning point, okay? Millennials? Yeah, yeah. yeah. all right. Uh, any other? Uh, uh, well, Larry, we're going to talk to us. you got somebody who hasn't had a chance to say anything yet. How about the oldest in the room? Uh, I don't know who that might be. Anybody uh, 70 in the room? Yeah, no, do I? Dan, all right, come on. I went to your birthday parties, I know. Uh, <laughs> so what are you going to do, Dan? I'm going to use LastPass because those passwords drive me crazy. Okay, all right. 
So we got last pass the winner. Okay. Anybody else um, got a great one to share? Annie, you're uh, you're on that young who's going line there. Um, I'm gonna do the free the what was it the the RSSP immediately. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I just want to be in touch with topics I actually care about, be updated on. How do you spell it? Feed. Oh, it's like, it, it helps so much. Instead of opening up things, I mean, and, and you know, it's new to topics. You can do it by topic, yeah. or you can do it by publication. So, literally, when I open it up, every morning, I see the exact name of the four, like, topics. So, I got a poll in here. How many of you are from Ann Arbor or Washington County? Most everybody? Pat, uh, say what you want, because Pat has, is doing a little test marketing. She is the publisher of The Observer. And what is your question, Pat? So I'm curious to know. Take, take this. Patricia Garcia. I'm curious to know how many of you would use an Ann Arbor Observer app to identify events yes. that you are interested oh, yes. in on a, either a time or a type of event basis. Okay. So we're expecting that from you next month, and you got to come in. We'll be your, we'll be your, your, uh, your beta group, okay? Um, we're gonna one other quick thing. Uh, we try to try to help people uh, support one another in the group here. So first of all, anybody at a job that they're offering, they're looking to hire. Me. Derek, can say what it is. Yeah, Ingenix is hiring a marketing coordinator. Okay, Ingenix marketing coordinator. Downtown Ann Arbor. Media company. Okay. Anybody else have a job to offer? Uh, yes, Ann. We have Ann Marson. I'm a managing Ann partner. Ann Marson, I can't just say it real loud. Yeah, I'm a managing partner at Atomic Object. We're a custom software firm. We're looking for software designers. Okay, so Atomic Object, uh, looking for software designers. All right. Uh, okay, Lee. The Michigan Theater is seeking a digital marketing specialist. Okay, Michigan Theater, ooh, sexy place to work back right there. Uh, a digital marketing coordinator, okay? Specialist, all right? Anybody else got jobs? Anybody looking for a job? Wants to promote, uh, yes. Uh, I'm Christina Palachek. I spent almost a decade in... Stand up, Christina. Okay. Your pitch time. I spent almost a decade in sales in the wine industry, and I'm in a, a career change, looking to get into social impact, either locally or globally, on an entrepreneurial or maybe investment, micro-loan, micro-credit level. Okay, I've got one for you. I'll talk to you about my wife's project, Stories for Hope Rwanda, which is uh, okay. looking for somebody, okay? Yes, in the back. Debbie Schneider, after 37 plus years, I've uh, left a business where I was the office manager, and I'm looking for marketing or sales okay. or recruiting. Okay, from office or... manager to marketing or sales, <laughs> Debbie Schneider, all right. Anybody else? Yes. Tony Nestro, uh, 23 years in program management and new business development in automotive manufacturing. Okay, program management in auto manufacturing. All right, great. Well, those are the opportunities. And again, if, if you put, Roger, did you have something? Um, I wanted to pitch uh, an event, Annual Collaboration for Entrepreneurship, is next Thursday. It's an annual event where about 800 to 1,000 entrepreneurs, investors, and service providers get together at Burton Manor in Livonia. And I think it's still $25 if you sign up today uh, for about eight hours of content. There's a uh, five sessions, uh, uh, breakout sessions twice, and then keynote and pitch competition, and a whole bunch of uh, networking that you can do there. And for $25, you get $25 for the food, then all the content that you get, all the networking is basically free. So Starts at 2, right, Roger? Starts at 2 o'clock. Um, 2 o'clock at? Uh, it's at Burton Manor, Livonia. If you go to ace-event, Dot org. You can okay. uh, register. And uh, Stuart, uh, the um, University of Michigan, a lot of people want to get connected, especially get a team out. You know, is there a contact point at the university? Martin, you may know this too. So if, if a startup like Molly, you're already working with some teams, I think, or, or yeah, so with Stuart, okay. But that's a really great resource because we have BBAs and MBAs and engineering students who want to get hands-on consulting work, and uh, how do they connect with the university on that? Uh, Zellory Institute, uh, Google it, or ZLI, and uh, if our website looks like it's 12 years old, it is. Uh, a new one's on the way, so forgive us the, the look and feel of the current uh, interface, it's gonna get better, but Zellory okay. Institute. Okay, and then what, what's your email, if you wanna go direct to the... Uh, 
My personal email is Thor Stu, Stuart Thornhill, T H O R S T E W, first four letters of each name, um, at umich.edu. Yeah. One of the one of the uh, difficulties I think with the U, there's so many different entry points that it's hard for a team to know. But I know uh, I've coached. Mark, you have something on that? I would just say uh, you can also go to the Business Engagement Center site at uh, umich.edu. Okay. B E C. Because you don't have to be a big business to connect with these. I mean, as a matter of fact, they're looking for startups. You don't have to have a number, great number of people, but they're looking for good ideas where these are the best and the brightest, except for the kids up the street in Lansing, but uh, second best and brightest for the most part. But I'm kidding. <laughs> Heather, you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to also, since computers in the house, I wanted to plug in. Um, we're having a conference tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Major sponsors of a great event coming up at Michigan Theater on Sunday, February 8th. It's called Glen Campbell. Glen Campbell. Um, it's about Alzheimer's and, and memory loss. Okay. And it's going to be showing his movie, which is just an awesome movie, heart wrenching as you can imagine. But it's something that's going to affect all of us, the baby boomers, and those millennials who are getting yeah. so big, and we'll eventually be. That's a great catch up. For Glen Campbell, it's another good name for an app by the time I get to Phoenix. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I think we're going to wrap up. We're looking forward to Elliot uh, on, well, it's last uh, Friday in February, I believe. And uh, we're going to be very excited about that. Elliot, by the way, is a new grandfather, so he's a completely changed man. Right? Yeah. All right, so um, any last words? Uh, I think we need to give them a great hand for a fabulous presentation. Mommy and you that they'd be willing to come back on a yearly basis because I think this would be really valuable information and it's you know it's great to uh, hear it hear it presented in such a concise way. And on doc, on uh, Monday I will put out a Dr. Rob with a link to the video, a link to the presentations, everything on it, and um, I will try to highlight a few of these points. If any of you are not on the Dr. Rob uh, mailing list. Uh, you know, let me know. It comes out every Monday morning. And also, please leave a, a pack of cards on the table so that we can double check our contact information for everybody to be sure that uh, you're on the right address and everything. All right, uh, feel free to hang out. And please don't leave any food behind because uh, play, take it back to work with you. We'll get some boxes for you. Uh, and thank you very much, Bank of Ann Arbor, for present for this. And uh, we're looking forward, Patty, to uh, a wonderful collaboration and more opportunities in the future. As a matter of fact, we're trying to get Tim Marshall, uh, who's the president, to speak in June about your great music series, which is called what? Sonic Lunch. Sonic Lunch. Okay. We, we hope to become the next Sonic Lunch, Leaders Connect, but uh, <laughs> Sonic Lunch will be something that Tim and Bank of Ann Arbor launched, and it now gets a thousand people probably on, on, uh, on the square in Ann Arbor. So. Uh, Tim will be talking about the story of that in, in uh, June, which will be pretty exciting. All right, we'll, uh, we'll all see you all next month then. <laughs>